talking country girls and city women. It's your say. Gather listeners. She's gonna shout it, gonna sing it, do it her own way. Walking together on the road, your mama swung her hammer yesterday. Watch my pretty mouth. In my family, my mom always said to me, there's three things you don't talk about at dinner. That's religion, how much money you make, and politics. And I think we're doing all three tonight. So um, everybody, please remember that this is a place where everyone can freely share ideas without judgment, without any kind of you know, booing, or you can cheer as much as you want, but it's a positive environment, and um, it'll stay that way. And if everybody is akin to that, everybody will be happy. Sorry, Jalen. Um, I'd also like to, the whole Women Say Something team would like to acknowledge um, that there's another election that's going on in our community at the moment. The Mardi Gras board is going to election this Saturday to elect a new board for the 2013-2014 um, year. Um, there are 14 candidates running for eight seats, but what's very inspiring is seeing that there are six women that are running for those seats. Yeah. So if you are a Mardi Gras member, it would be of benefit to get down and get involved. It's always important, obviously, to be involved with Mardi Gras. Um, it's a really solid showing, and we wish everybody, everybody in the election well. Um, we encourage everyone to tweet away tonight. Get your phones. Use the hashtag WSS. Our um, usual tweet buddy, Daniel Warby, is overseas. I don't know how she could have done that when we're so busy here. But um, we're um, relying on you, so tweet away. Um, and make the night lively. Um, the subject is election, so it can be a little bit possibly dry. So please have a look on your tables, have a look at all the um, wonderful guests that we have on our panels, and you know, think about some questions, because we will be opening up the last 15 minutes of each 50 minute segment to questions from the floor. And your involvement is like really, really, really expected. <laughs> so without further ado, let's get into election. Somebody's put newspapers on my chair. <laughs> Thank you, Materia. Uh, okay, this is our first panel. Directly to my right, Materia Touré. How are you? Give, we need to get you a microphone. Have you got one? I, oh, you can spend the night just talking to me. <laughs> I don't know how everybody else would feel about that, though. Um, you're a New Zealand member of parliament and the female co-leader of the Green Party. Next to Materia, we have Dr. Ann Summers, best-selling author, journalist, and thought leader with a long career in politics, media, and business. Next to Ann, we have Adrienne Leong. She is a pragmatic idealist and political advisor from Malaysia. She's a member of Empower, a nonpartisan feminist NGO, where she trains young women, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice already, young women politicians, how to run successful strategic election campaigns with the aim of increasing the number of female lawmakers. And all the way on my right, the wonderful Julie McCrossin. I can't believe I'm on the stage with Julie McCrossin. <laughs> wow. Um, she's been, her, spent, you spent your life talking to people. And um, she's an amazing um, radio broadcaster, journalist, comedian, and campaign, campaigner for women and gays, gay rights. So please put your hands together for our first panel tonight. Hi guys. Um, I think I'd start out like with an open question for everyone after the, you know, the politics that we've watched over the last three years in Australia. And um, do all women who enter politics have rocks in their heads? Material, <laughs> would you like to start? Yeah, as our guest, as our guest from across <laughs> the ocean, oh. what's your take on that? Uh, politics is an evil, dirty business. There's no doubt about it. Evil, dirty business, and it's really hard work. And women who put themselves forward for it are up for the fight of their lives. But they do it. They do it, and they do it because they care about people other than themselves. I mean, I've, I've been in Parliament in New Zealand for 11 years now and my overwhelming experience of women parliamentarians is that they, are, they might not be very confident about their views or their, um, their entitlement 
to be in Parliament, but they are courageous about standing up for the people that they're there for. And above all else, I think it's the courage of women who put themselves forward, whether it's parliamentary politics at a national level like I'm at, or in local government, or all the other forms of politics that women are involved in. It's a courageous act, uh, even, if, even if it's a very difficult one. Mm, I agree. We'll get back to that a, a bit later. Anne, rocks in their heads are solid. Well, it's a pretty um, tough question to have to answer, um, given what's happened in this country you know, in the last few weeks, when we saw our first female prime minister basically bullied out of office. And uh, I think you know, most of us would have seen that the remarks that she gave that night, 26th of um, June uh, 2013, about four or five weeks ago, I think it was now, where she um, tried to sort of make some sense out of what had happened to her. Uh, and she said that, you know, gender wasn't everything, it wasn't nothing, it was something, and we really have to try and figure out what it was. But she also said that she hoped that, you know, what she'd gone through would actually make it easier for, for future generations and for girls coming on. And I really hope that's true, but I fear that it's not. Because I think that, you know, women, particularly, say, young, younger women in their 20s, thinking about a career in politics, We'll have a look and see what how Gillard was not just you know not just the usual you know argy bargy of politics, but she was really singled out as a woman and treated disgracefully as a woman, um, including as you know really vile forms of sexual vilification um, that no man in this country has ever had to put up with, and uh, you know she's very resilient and she apparently you know is able to kind of let it. Um, wash over her but but most of us would find that pretty tough going and I think that it could actually be a bit of a disincentive to other women so one of the things I think we should all be kind of thinking about and talking about going forward is how we try and uh, kind of deal with that so that uh, women aren't going to be put off going into politics. Do you think Anne, that, that, that her gender was her only downfall? during the time that she was Prime Minister? No, not at all. I mean, obviously, um, there are a lot of things that went wrong. Um, politically, I think she probably made some, um, you know, some wrong calls and some bad decisions. And, I mean, I think her biggest problem was her inability to communicate via television with, with the people. And, I mean, you know, you've, anyone who's met her um, will know that, you know, one-on-one -on -one or in a small group or even on Q&A, you know, in certain situations, you wouldn't meet a more witty, you know, vibrant, clever, engaging person. But that person mostly disappeared when... She didn't really transfer. Yeah, so, so you know, the majority of voters didn't see that person. They saw a very wooden, stilted person. So that was, I think that was a, a big problem. And, um, but I also think that we can't overlook the extent to which the three years of, of relentless stalking, undermining slagging off, vilification and all the rest of it undermined her so much that not only did that kind of, you know, make it easier for her to make mistakes, but it also meant that whatever she did, she was marked down for it. You know, she couldn't take a break. if She had no luck, mm. you know, whereas other people in this game uh, tend to have a lot more luck than she had. Yeah, we'll go into that more a bit later. And Adrian, so you were helping young women politicians to run successful election campaigns and be successful in that field. How does the, the situation that we've dealt with here in Australia, how does that look to you? As far as you know, educating young women and helping them into a field, it's a, it's a, it's a possible minefield. Uh, well, I think that the situation in Australia uh, is uh, uh, particularly prominent because of the prominence of Julia Gillard being the very first woman holding such a high position in Malaysia, uh, sorry, in Australia. Uh, well, in the case of uh, young women who enter politics in uh, Malaysia, they are also subjected to uh, gendered attacks, perhaps, perhaps not to a scale uh, which, uh, uh, actually, cor I, I correct myself, perhaps not to the kind of um, attacks that were specifically personally targeted towards uh, Julia Gillard, and, and, and that was the most striking point about, uh, uh, about Gillard and, and her time in government. Uh, in the case of Malaysia, uh, Women who enter politics, uh, regardless of uh, whether they are uh, younger or older, uh, they're, high, they're, 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 expect, they're held to uh, higher standards of uh, morality. Uh, 
uh, they ha they have to have a they, they in addition they have to have, also have to be even more competent than uh, male politicians to be able to be nominated by their parties and then to win in uh, in, in that election and when they do get elected and uh, it has been seen from the uh, track record of uh, female members of parliament both at the federal and state level that they are uh, highly capable, more capable than men, because somehow we don't ask men uh, who are nominated to be candidates, uh, how competent is he? Or like, is, is he competent enough as it's opposed assumed. to, uh, yeah. when it comes to placing a women candidate, the question is often asked, uh, do we, is she, is she competent enough? Do we actually have enough competent women uh, to, to, to field in a seat? Because the assumption is that the default is to field a male candidate. Julie, what's, what's your view on, is, I mean, are women just crazy going into this? In, in Australia, I mean, are, are women just nuts? Uh, well, look, obviously, I passionately believe in women uh, getting engaged in public life. Uh, and uh, I, I want to take the opportunity, actually, to pay tribute to Anne Summers for documenting in detail the range of abusive media coverage that, that uh, Julia Gillard got. Because I think one of the problems at the moment is, and one of the issues that is sort of... I think relevant to this panel is what's happening to the media and, and particularly what's happening. So one, we have the fragmentation and the enormous diversity. So most of us only watch a thin slice. So the value of the work that Anne has done and, and also Kerry Ann Walsh in her book, The Stalking of Julia Gillard, is that they've given us an overview of what's happening across the media. Uh, uh, because otherwise we just have a distorted and isolated view. But I think the other thing that I guess want to put on the table is the degree to which the changes in the media contributed to the struggles of Julia Gillard and all people, particularly women who enter public life, because there is a, not just a fragmentation, but a dumbing down and a popularisation and a focus on personalities and a failure to do in-depth work on policy and what we need to have uh, happen in our country if our children or the children that we have in our family that we care about are to have a, a good future. And so one of my passionate concerns is the, the denigration of public administration. And by that I mean quality work by intelligent public servants. And again, Anne has been at the most senior level uh, in the federal uh, government context as part of her work history, particularly in women's affairs. But I, I just wanted to mention, there's a woman called Jennifer Westacott, who heads up a thing called the Business Council of Australia. And last week, some of you will have seen the media coverage, they put out a 10-year plan for what needs to happen in Australia. And that plan involved consultations with people like the Benevolent Society and Mission Australia. So it wasn't just business, it was government and NGO. And Jenny is a person with a history of running government agencies in both Victoria and New South Wales. She's worked in the private sector, KPMG, at a federal government level. Why am I mentioning this person? Well, women have many ways to contribute to public life, not just in elected officials. But the quality of that 10-year plan as an integrated, long-term vision for our country is manifestly better than anything that is currently coming out, I'm afraid, of our current Labor government, or indeed the quality of work coming from the coalition. I mean, bipartisan in my critique. Uh, and uh, I'd like you to read a book by a man called James Button, called Speechless, the son of John Button, a former Labor leader, because he was a speechwriter for Rudd in the first government. I'll just finish on this, I don't mean to take too much time. But he writes what he learned about the Australian public service. And one of my concerns when I read Anne's work and Kerry Ann Walsh's work about what happened to Julia Gillard is that the media was focusing so much on this leadership debate. It failed to deal in any coherent way with the incredibly critical national challenges that we're facing. So we need women in public life because we need good people in politics. I mean, wait, I agree, couldn't agree more. I mean, would you, would you agree that we need in that the level um, that we need to set higher standards, not only from the media, but also from politicians? Is that even possible? Um, no, and pretty much to everyone. Um, the standards seem to just, uh, and, and reading your, your you know, just thing about Julia Gillard, just the standard of the sexism and the drawings. And if you haven't seen it, I suggest you really go to Ann Summers' um, webpage and have a look because it's really disturbing. Mm. And I. I was really shocked, even though I knew the standard had fallen greatly, 
I was amazed. But how can we change standards that seem to be falling through the floor? Well, I could just comment on that. I, just to um, one of the things that really worries me. And I'm answering the question. But I'm just a little bit of a, a segue on the way that that this kind of the normalisation of this. Um, um, detraction of Gillard and this sort of um, demeaning of her is now so great that I, mean, I was reading the Herald today, I was reading the column by Ross Gittins, who's, you know, normally a fairly, you know, normally quite staid sort of person, doesn't you know, exa- engage in extravagant comments, but he was writing there and I saw suddenly this word Julia popped up in his column. He's writing about, he's an economics writer for God's sake, and here's this word Julia. It's not in quotation marks. So it's now gone into the language so that, you know, somebody like an economics writer for the Sydney Morning Herald can just routinely refer to the previous Prime Minister as a Jew liar and not even put it in quote marks. So in other words, this is just so normalised now. This, 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 uh, so it's more than dumbing down. It's also there's a form of contempt for people. And, the, you know, the, the whole uh, reason why she was called that in the first place, you know, because, you know, the, of the whole business about the carbon tax... You know, to me, is another example of, of the kind of, you know, the rotten deal that she had because plenty of politicians have and will continue to change their minds and to break promises and normally they're not kind of, you know, put in the stocks for it. Um, you know, people get over it. But in her case, any mistake that she made um, is kind of like permanently damaged her reputation even now she's no longer there. So that, I think, is a real problem. And as for, you know, Julie's point about the... Um, you know, the levels of, of debate and discussion, well, you know, I couldn't agree with you more that, that um, you know, what really annoyed me about the media over the last couple of years is, you know, the only story coming out of Canberra was the leadership challenge. And when they finally got rid of her, the only story out of Canberra was, when will the election be? Now, the fact that she had already set it and tried to get rid of all this uncertainty and all of the destabilisation that goes with this constant speculation about when the date will be. Um, naturally, you know, Mr Rudd said, OK, no, he's not going to have it any day but the 14th because that was the day she'd set. So we had all this, this destabilising commentary about when the election would be. And it just seems to me that... Um, this is one of the reasons I've just recently started my own magazine, Anne Summers Reports, to try and, you know, provide something with a bit of bloody meat to it and not something that's not um, diverted into this mindless <laughs> speculation. Anyway, copies of the brochure at the desk on the way out. <laughs> Please forgive that outrageous act of self-advertisement. But, Anne, do we have any chance? I mean, you listen to Question Time. I mean, it's, it, and, and you listen to the papers. And everything, the way that people speak, July, and just everything. The, the standard is, I mean, it has it, it's not always been that low. Has it just fallen through the floor? Is there, other than reading your fabulous column... What do we do? I mean, what? Do, how do people protest or say? Is it like this in New Zealand? Um, yeah. What is it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you you had a female prime minister, and yeah, I don't believe she got two. 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 Um, yeah, one was as a result of the first as a result of a coup in the National Party, and <laughs> but only one who was actually elected. That was Helen Clark, uh, and and Helen suffered very very similar attacks for the entirety of her prime ministership. Um, over sexualisation of her questions around her sexual orientation because her uh, chief advisor was a lesbian woman who stayed with her the whole through, period through her prime ministership was very effective. Might disagree with her, but she was very effective. Um, so uh, there was uh, constant uh, attacks on her and her parents. Uh, so yes, that same those same attacks continued, and they are the same attacks that occur to women throughout the society. Like the, it, it is more. It has escalated in the political environment because the stakes are higher and because the opposition will take any opportunity to exploit any weakness and they will use it to their, to, for political purposes. So, for example, one of the memes that was promoted by the um, National Party when Helen Clark was Prime Minister was the nanny state, that the nanny state is you know, trying to control your life and therefore ne- they need to get rid of it. The only reason it worked is because it's a nanny state and she was a woman. In fact, if you look at policy, this, partic- this national government is much more interventionist in individual lives for, in all sorts of ways, uh, but the nanny state meme simply won't attach itself to national in the same way because they don't have a female um, leader. So there's a, in some respects, it's in politics, every 
perceived weakness will be exploited by your political op opponents. And David Longy's case, it was the fact he was fat. Um, there, there will, uh, in my case and in some of the other Māori leaders of political parties, it's, there's a less less explicit, but nonetheless constant criticism around or uh, critique of us in terms of being Māori and therefore radical and dangerous. So, so again, these are perceived weaknesses um, of, of political leadership, so therefore they're exploited. So it is sometimes hard to separate them out, except that if we do want to clean up politics, actually, to make it more honest, to make it cleaner and more available to for what it's supposed to be, which is genuinely representative of the community as a whole and setting genuine standards for behaviour. Um, in, you know, there's no way, I'm assuming in the Australian Parliament as well as New Zealand Parliament, no way we would have any of our kids in any classroom anywhere in the country Speaking behaving, like behaving oh. anything like what we behave in Parliament on a daily basis. There's a, I mean, it's just shocking when, when the kids come and they sit in the chamber and they, you know, they sit above us and watch us behave. It's, it's humiliating knowing that these little kids would have got rules in their own classroom. They would never allow them to behave the shouting and the abuse <laughs> um, that goes on all the time. <laughs> but it's, but so, so for women in particular who are wanting to try to change the standard and lift it, it's it, we have to find other ways of collaborating around what's acceptable and what's not. And in New Zealand, there's been a little bit of kind of cross-party women. It's not, it's not organised, but women talking to each other more about the sexism we see in the chamber and being prepared to support each other from whichever party who calls it. So if a woman MP... Yeah, so... And there needs to be more of that. I think that helps, but it also means that as women we have to avoid wherever we can engaging in that same practice, the shouting, the abuse. I mean, it's hard. Let me tell you, on a daily basis, it is very hard to sit there and watch people do things that you hate and will know will damage and hurt the people you care for. Uh, but if we, we don't maintain that standard, then we don't set a standard, and then it means that as new MPs come on board, um, they are more likely to engage in the worst behaviour. It's a very tricky political environment to have to try to change. It's a generational change. But I think it is happening. I think we're seeing it happen in, in New Zealand, partly because of proportional representation, which is helping to change the face of parliamentarians, younger, more female, and browner. Awesome. Adrian, what do you see as... Um <laughs> what do you think that can be done to help support young women going into politics? Uh, uh, one of the, among the major barriers that uh, women face to enter politics is uh, lack of political financing. Uh, because uh, women in Malaysia, uh, they don't earn as much money as, uh, women in, uh, as, as the men in Malaysia. Uh, similar situation in Australia. Yeah. Uh, and there's also uh, the, necessit the necessity of receiving your political party's support because um, uh, each, po the, uh, each political party, they can only field that one candidate for that seat. And in, in the context of Malaysia, uh, the, the great fight is between uh, two different coalitions. Uh, and um, the opposition coalition, which is, uh, the, 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 uh, ha consists, of three it consists of three political parties and the, and the incumbent uh, coalition, which is, ha has been in government for, since 1957, unbroken, making it the longest uh, coalition. 19 1957? Yes, yes. Okay. Since, since, since independence, since the, since the British left, uh, which makes it the longest uh, serving coalition in the world. Uh, they've got about uh, 20 uh, different political parties within them, uh, three major ones and, and many small ones. And... Uh, uh, because each coalition, sorry, I, I, should have, I should have said political budget, each coalition can only feel that one uh, person for that, that seat. Uh, that means that uh, the president of that coalition has to uh, placate all the different political parties to ensure that they have some representation, to ensure that they stay within the coalition. And the same with the opposition as well, although to a lesser degree, because it's just three political parties. And that reduces the number of seats that each political party can have. And within each political party, there's uh, only X number of seats that can go to women, and that decision is held uh, by the very uh, uh, top level of the political party. And that uh, uh, process of selecting candidates to sit in that uh, seat is um, uh, not, not transparent. Uh, it's, 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 it's power that's held by just a few people, which are mainly men. And uh, 
So for, 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 a, for a woman candidate who wants to enter politics and to uh, be selected, she needs to have uh, substantial resources and substantial network and social capital within that political party, which is not easy to, to have given the disadvantage of uh, possibly lower education, uh, possibly lower access to uh, political funds. Uh, that has to do with... Uh, a woman's access to uh, opportunity in the workforce because if women can't work, then they've got less access to money. And uh, as, as is common in the world, women are, spend a greater proportion of their money not on themselves but, uh, but, but more on, on towards looking after their family, which means less money for themselves, which means less money to pursue uh, political ambition. Mm -hmm. So uh, these, are, these are common uh, barriers that uh, women face uh, around the world, I believe, and, and they are faced by women in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And, and Summers, would you agree with that? Yeah, I'd be very interested to know um, what proportion of the parliament is, is women. Is female. Uh, yeah. 11 percent. 11 percent. Oh, 23 out of 222. And it's been unchanged since... Uh, it, it was the same in the last... Yeah. In, in 2008, and, it, and we had our elections in May this year, and it still stayed, stayed 23. But on the positive side... Uh, the number of, can of female candidates that were fielded uh, increased by 10%, but uh, very often uh, women were fielded against women, women uh, and, and so it <laughs> yeah, nullified yeah, each other. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think um, the situation here, at least when it comes to federal parliament, um, you know, we have about 28% about of federal parliament is women, but that figure went down in the last federal election where we had four fewer women elected in 2010, and I would think there'll be even fewer after this election on September the 7th. So, you know, we can't exactly predict what the outcome will be yet, but I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic. So, you know, it seems to me that... And, when, and we were talking before upstairs that, that, you know, we were so kind of pleased a few years ago that it seemed we were making such headway that we not only had a female Prime Minister, female Governor-General, you know, I think three female state governors, and we had women premiers in, um, in Queensland, in New South Wales, in Tasmania... Um, we had a woman chief minister in the ACT. Um, now the only one who's... There are only two left. The, um, the, the Premier of Tasmania, Lara Giddings, and she is very unlikely to win her election next March. And um, uh, Katie Gallagher, who is the chief minister of the ACT, now she will, she'll be the last woman standing as a, as a head of government in this country. Um, so, you know, the figures are, are a little bit... Dis even though they weren't bad, 28% is not bad compared with most other Western countries, mm. but it is going down. And I think, you know, we, maybe we got a little bit complacent or maybe we thought that we'd kind of got there and we could kind of relax. Uh, but it turns out you have to, it's a constant battle. Mm. And, uh, you know, th one of the problems is that, you know, the Liberal Party doesn't believe in quotas, so they have no means of guaranteeing um, an adequate number of women. And I think that's a problem for them. Uh, the Labor Party has quotas, but they ignore them, so that's a problem for them. <laughs> So, you know, neither of the major parties is really taking adequate steps, in my view, to guarantee um, increased numbers of women, let alone 50 per cent. Could I just say, Kate, you asked earlier, you know, what can we do to address the kind of disrespectful and abusive yeah. political discourse that, that Anne and others have, have documented? And I, I guess what I feel very strongly is that it's up to us to not engage in the common denigration of politicians and public servants, which is just so common in our culture. Um, I, the, what's good for women is education, health and disability care, which to me is one of the most exciting reforms. I've had a lot to do with the disability sector and when it comes to care, Obviously, women are overrepresented in terms of the impact on their personal life. I am part of the tsunami of baby boomers heading towards our health system. I've recently been very unwell. I don't know if anyone's noticed, but I'm a, I've lost about a third of my body weight. I've been spending a lot of time in hospitals recently, and I've seen the pressure that system is under. And as my, my I'm nearly 60, as my cohort moves forward, enormous policy cha challenges. We need good ministers in federal, state and local government. I, no, we don't have ministers in local government, but we need good ministers and we need to attract the best people to the public sector because about a quarter of our gross domestic product 
flows from public expenditure and it has a disproportional impact on women because education, health, disability care, these are areas that have enormous impact on women. So I guess I'd like to hear us encouraging each other to go into public life, encouraging the best people to consider the public service um, and it, saying tax is the price of civilization. We need more tax. Uh, and it, it, that's both at the personal and, the, and at the corporate level. I know we've had a change today and Jennifer Westercott from the Business Council of Australia, who I was praising earlier, would not agree with me on this point. I still value her 10-year integrated comprehensive plan. Um, but uh, I, I think the buck stops with us. We mustn't be part of the cynical abuse. And if I could just say one more quick thing. Please I know do, I know what you mean about going into parliament or, or local government and watching that sort of robust, as they say, oral interaction. But uh, as someone... I mean, I always say if you, go, if you go into law and you're at the bar table as a barrister, if you go into politics and you're in the, uh, you know, in the, in the parliamentary chamber, or if you're going to stand-up comedy, where I've been as well, they are the three combat oral sports. And I want to... Not just say, oh, it's ugly. I want to say to our young girls, get your daughters and your nieces into debating as soon as possible. Because Julia Gillard was great when she stood up to the box. And any woman who's going to be a leader has got to engage in that oral skill. My main job these days is, when my voice is a bit stronger, is running around rooms facilitating discussions on complex topics. And when you open the floor, it's mainly men and boys who put their hand up. It's not women. Women are afraid of getting things wrong. And I mean, you'd know this, Kate, you're an MC. And we need, I think it's a big factor in why we're under 30%. It's not just sexism, it's women not wanting to risk being stupid or getting it wrong. And we, and we do, I do it all the time. You know? <laughs> oh, maybe I won't say that. Or maybe I'll, and, and women do, we second guess ourselves. Where men, men generally do not. And, and I would rather have the, the robust Westminster debate. I'd prefer it when it's on policy and not personality. But exactly. I, I'd rather have that robust debate than violence. Because in the end, the Westminster debate, which grew up in the British Parliament, was an alternative to the aristocrats fighting each other and fighting the king. That oral combat is better than actual combat. Uh, I'd like it to be more civilised and policy focused, but it's better than fighting. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> And I suppose that what you're, what you're saying is also in our own communities, bullying and harassment and all of that kind of behavior. It, it filters through our communities. It's part of our media and it needs to be stopped at every level, doesn't it? In I think that's true. But there's people like, and I don't mean to show political um, preferences here, uh, but if I could name one politician who doesn't do it, it would be Tanya Plibersek, current <laughs> minister for health, true. Who, who just happens to be my local member. And I only, I've only once seen her lose it in, in, on the floor of Parliament. She mainly keeps her dignity. She, she does her fair share of yelling across the chamber. <laughs> <Does she? laughs> yeah. Okay, we're going to do a little gear change. I think you have to, actually. <laughs> Materia, Sorry. in yeah. New Zealand, you have secured marriage equality. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. I will send that message back to New Zealand. <laughs> I saw you on YouTube. Um, <laughs> what advice do you have for us in Australia on um, getting this over the line? Oh. Oh, just, just keep going. Persistence, persistence. We, we just, you just can't let it. You can't let it drop. And, uh, and, it, I mean, it comes down to numbers at the end of the day. But it also comes down to people and their families and their friends and. The inherent belief that the, most people will do what they believe is right. And while we might not always agree with what that is, if you can at least move people to the point where, they, where they're doing what they believe is right as opposed to what they think is popular or what they think will get them um, a, you know, a, a new job in, um, in Parliament, you, you are making it a personal issue for them. And I think that was part of... The debate that, if you saw any of the debate on the tally, you would have seen people talking about really personal stories. Those who disagreed and voted against it were still talking from a personal place. And that was still better. It was still better because it, it's a place from which people can be talked to and moved if they need to be moved. But even if they can't, at least you know it's real um, and it's not a game. So uh, just being persistent and 
and talking to people's humanness about something so important. It was amazing to be there on the night. It was uh, an incredible <laughs> thing. It's pretty good. <laughs> um, Louisa Wall uh, from Labour, uh, that was her bill that she put forward. Um, and so it was just amazing that she was able to do that. As a, uh, I think, yeah, it's, it was amazing for her to do that work. And Maturia, do you have any advice um, for women that are running in our election that's coming up or any other elections? Um, you need a really hard skin. You need a tough skin, whatever you're going to do. Um, and I think that uh, you need to be... It's, you need a really tough skin and you need to be really clear about why you're there so you know what you're defending and what you're fighting against. And pe that people will attack you at every possible level that they can. But uh, resilience is really important. You're there because you believe in what you're standing up for, no matter what party it's for, any of those things. So you've got a community you love and care for. That community needs you to speak for them. So even if it's times you feel that it's, it's not... a I think for lots of women, they go ahead um, with politics because they don't believe it's about them, they believe it's about others. And if that is where you get strength from, then that's great. That's great because you're there to speak for others. When I, was, I first was elected in 2002, I was 32. Um, I've been a lawyer for a little bit, but I'd before that been involved in a lot of activist alternative politics. Um, and, and hadn't really involved myself in established pol politics at all. And there were women that had never had a voice at all who said that they wanted, they were supporting me to be in Parliament because there was somebody who believed the same things that they believed in, who said the same things that they were saying, who would stand up for them regardless of how difficult or tricky it would be. And they needed me and others like me to be there. That is often a great driver for women wanting to get into politics. And if it is a driver for you, then do it. It's an amazing experience, mad and rocks in your head as it might be. <laughs> it is worth doing. It is worth doing. Adrian, what, would you, what, what advice would you give, specific advice, to uh, you know, a woman that was running into elect, an election? Have a very good campaign manager. <laughs> Can I agree with that? Kate Fairman was the campaign manager for the New Zealand Greens in 2002 in the, in the election that I was elected. So she got me my first job. Thank you. Any other advice? Uh, raise as much money as you can. Mm. <laughs> Political financing is, that's is a, crucial. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Anne Summers, what advice would you give, not only for a woman running an election, but dealing with the media? So I'm not sure that I can really answer that, but I just wanted to tell you all a very interesting little story that, about a political development that's um, taking off in this election. And I just, I've heard about it, and then I read something today that seems that it's really quite phenomenal. And that is uh, the seat of Indi, which is in um, northern Victoria, and I think it might even cut across the border and be lower New South Wales as well. The local member is Sophie Mirabella, who we probably all have seen on television. Um, <laughs> now, she is the Liberal. Um, there, are, there are about 10 candidates in this seat, and a very large number of them are women. But the one who's got Sophie apparently extremely worried is a woman um, who's running as an independent. And I'm sorry, I can't think of her name. Does anyone here know her name? Kathy McGowan. Kathy McGowan, right. And apparently, she is running an absolutely exempt. She's a local girl or local woman. She's. Um, you know, she's not radical, she's not kind of a threat to anybody, but she just exemplifies a good local candidate um, who apparently has a really good chance of winning this seat. And that's kind of remarkable because that shows somebody who's outside the party system and normally you don't have, a, you know, a hope in hell. I mean, OK, we've had some independents win in seats in this country, but usually they've um, had very long-standing followings or they're, you know... Special circumstances that have allowed them to succeed, but it'd be very unusual if this Kathy McGowan wins. It will be quite extraordinary. But she does, from the little that I've read about it, she does seem to be an example of a woman able to run a very effective campaign. Apparently, one of the things that that I read today was that apparently Mirabella's people are really quite worried, and they um, had been sent. There's a letter has been sent out was leaked to the media saying that, you know, that Kathy McGowan's people have had three letters in the paper this morning and we only had one, you know. So this kind of thing, you know, and particularly in, in country seats, I think that kind of real grassroots level of, you know, ringing the radio stations, 
writing the letters, you know, being at the shopping centres, all that kind of retail politics that aren't quite as important probably in the inner city, you know, really matter there and, and clearly that's what you have to be good at. Um, but in terms of just sort of the general advice for, for women wanting to run, I mean, I guess the big question, um, you know, are you, which party are you going to be affiliated with? Which party are you going to try and, you know, make your way through? And, um, you know, that's a tough call. I mean, usually we have a sort of dis disposition to one uh, political set of views or another. Um, but the parties, let's face it, they're not very welcoming. They're just not. And so it's quite a tough business even to get in to the party and battle your way up within whatever party you've chosen. Um, and that's before you get to the position of actually d battling the other side. So it's tough. Julie? I guess I'd just like to put another issue on the table about the numbers of women in politics. Because I, I'm, I mean, I defer to the more detailed knowledge of others on this panel, all three of you, but my instinct or hunch is it's not just about discrimination, that it's partly about children and family. Because the um, hours that politicians work, and, and obviously sitting times obviously go over past midnight, but also this new 24-hour media cycle, which I think is, is changing the world a little bit like the digital revolution. I mean, it's obviously part of the digital revolution. It means that if you want to have children or even just keep a partner, um, it's a bloody hard thing to do. And, and that's... Yeah. And, and I think it is still... A, a, a cultural norm that men can have a wife who will mainly support them. I think that is still a cultural norm. So I do think some of the issue facing whether women will get into politics is the same as if you want to be a barrister or you want to be a television presenter or whatever. Things that have really un, un friend, family friendly hours. I, I think women with families need to talk more about how they're managing that. Yeah, I th no, I think you're right about that. And um, we also need to to fight for more space for women, with, especially with young children. Um, and so I went into Parliament, my daughter was nine, so she was a bit older and there was a bit easier to manage. There's, because of proportional representation in New Zealand, we're getting a younger cohort of MPs coming through. And so many of them I've come in, they haven't got families yet and they, do, they have families while they're there. Um, one of our younger MPs, Holly Walker, she was elected in 2011. She's pregnant. She's about to go on maternity leave in September. Um, we're all looking forward to the baby popping out. Um, but, so, but we're trying to... We're working with the Speaker in the Parliament to try to change some of the rules so that uh, it's easier for her to come back uh, next year and to come back at a pace that makes more sense for her and her child and her family. So she... Um, has more control and she's not penalised and neither are we politically for her desire to be the best possible mum she can in the circumstances of this job. Yeah. So, so, but it means, but part of it is coming from the fact that one of the Labour MPs, Nanaya Mahuta, uh, she has had a baby earlier in the year and she was penalised, her party was penalised because she, uh, it was around being in the House for votes and things like that and it actually made it politically difficult for her to take the time off that she needed to be with to breastfeed her baby on that night, and that's just not acceptable. It's not you it wouldn't accept that in any other workplace. And it shouldn't be acceptable in a parliamentary workplace either. So, uh, because she suffered that consequence, Nanaya, we've been able to force the well, not force, but trying to encourage the parliament to shift its practice. But you know, we've women have been having babies in parliament for decades now, and we're only slowly getting to that place because there aren't enough. Women having children in Parliament, there aren't enough of us um, in the past who've really wrapped around that woman and tried to encourage, uh, force the rule changes that we need um, to make it possible. But the thing is that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. It's much more obvious now. Uh, and as we get younger women coming in and having children, it will be the case that the place has to shift to cater for them. And so it should. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg. You've got to make the space. Um, and you've got to force the rule changes where you can, but you also need to have people come in and take the opportunities because otherwise it's too difficult to drive the need, if you, if you like, or drive the demand. Absolutely. We're going to open up to the floor. Can I see Vanessa with a microphone? There she is. Has anybody got any questions? Hello, hello, Vanessa, hello, hello, hello. Well, yes, I've got, microphone got one over there. To use it. <laughs> right at the back. Um, actually, my, my question's for Anne. Um, Anne... Um, I noticed um, when there was a um, change of uh, leadership recently about 
Can we turn the microphone up or can you speak directly into the front okay. of the microphone? Sorry. Um, um, uh, my question's for Anne. So, Anne, I noticed when there was a change of leadership recently that um, I think it was about eight ministers um, either stepped, went to the back bench or, and, and or said they were going to leave politics and not a single woman did. Um, should I make anything of that? Well, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you make of that, Anne? <laughs> Um, I actually got a fair bit of flack for, um, for saying it, um, um, particularly from people on the Labor side, who, some of whom said that uh, I shouldn't have expected women to sacrifice themselves, um, um, that, that, they, that, you know, that basically what, what those women made, what the individual choices they made, you know, we should respect those. And, you know, of course I do, but one of the things that really surprised me um, as far as I know, all of the women in the ministry voted, apart from Penny Wong, who we know very publicly, and she admitted that she had changed sides. But as far as I know, the other women all voted for Julia. Um, I'm disappointed that some of them didn't at least offer their resignations. Um, we know that several, at least three of the men uh, who voted for her voted the, uh, offered their resignations that weren't accepted and they're still in the ministry. So I think, uh, I don't want to name names here because I want to you know, single out people, but I think there are certain very prominent ministers who could have done that and would certainly have been, you know, begged to stay. So I don't think they would have hurt their careers, but they would have made a point. I just thought it was a, a kind of a bad look, if you like, that, that none of the women showed any solidarity with her, whereas I think, as you say, seven or eight of the guys did. Do you think that women, Anne, do you think that women have an obligation to support and speak out for other women when... Well, well actually, I do. Yeah. You do? I, I, I do. I think, um, you know, I, I'm not trying to... We, we, don't, we shouldn't be martyrs, and I don't think that, you know, women go into parliament um, or into politics or into any job solely as representatives of their sex. Mm. But I think while we are still uh, operating at a disadvantage, you know, it really is incumbent on women to look out for each other. And uh, certainly not to get in the in the way of other women. I mean, there's, I love this quote from Madeleine Albright, you know, who was the first female Secretary of State in the United States, where she says, you know, there's a special place in hell reserved for women who don't support other women. And I hope it's, <laughs> hope it's really hot. <laughs> oh, we got another question from the floor. I can't see you, Vanessa. I'm over Upstairs? here. Oh, here we go. Over here. <laughs> Hi, that was amazing. Thank you very much, all the panellists tonight. Um, I wanted to, I guess, maybe um, uh, follow on from the point, I think, that Anne, that you made about um, the party machinations, I guess, about how we can, we can constantly say to, um, to women, you need to stand up and enter into politics and, you know, we'll support you and everything. But, well, how does it work when we have, say, the Greens candidate for, um, say, Newtown, who says that this is a special lecturer and needs a special candidate and he, you know, uh, trots out his sort of atheism and his um, Trotskyist kind of <laughs> background. But yet he's not, he's a, he's a white, um, well-educated, probably middle to upper class man. And I, get, I guess, um, what, where does the responsibility lay in getting more women in parliament and in politics? Is it the individuals that have to put themselves out on the firing line? Is it the parties? that have to maybe sort of change the quota systems and whatnot, you know, or is it the voters, I guess? You know, I guess I, I'd like to know what you guys think about that, that general question. Sure. Material, you want to well, take um, one to start with? Look, as the, as the co-leader of a political party, I think it is the, my job as leader, not as the female leader, as the leader, to, um, to make sure that my party makes space and so, and but but then I come from a party that has that comes from a very alternative culture in many respects. You know, we were we were built out of an alternative view of what politics should look like. And so we, our party has always had co-leadership. Uh, we have at every level of our party, including at the political level, we have a 60/40 gender rule in our list formation, so that there is we always have gender equity in our list. We're the only political party that has consistently had more women than men in our caucus. 
because we have a structure that has rules and we, we, those rules lead to a culture of being constantly um, aware of where gender equity is occurring and when it's not. And so, you ha so my view is from, a, uh, from a, just a political party point of view is that the party must have rules that creates the space because without that you simply can't encourage women to come forward and it's where those if those rules don't exist then you can't build the culture and if you can't build the culture you don't build a long term space for women and for indigenous people and for other ethnicities to be involved in politics young people as well Adrian what do you think I think for political parties to have more women uh members are uh, winning and uh, becoming uh, members of parliament, there needs to be political will. And I think that's something that's uh, lacking in Malaysia. Uh, there are political parties who have uh, verbally said that oh, we will uh, have at least 30% quota, uh, field at least 30% quota of women as candidates in the last general election, which was just two months ago. Uh, but when the time came to, to name your candidates, uh, they, they had to say, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, like, we, we tried, but we cannot we, we don't have enough women who are, who are, who, 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 whom we can, can field. And then there's also the demand of wanting to win the, 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 the election, and so you want the most winnable candidate, and, it's, and they think that, oh, probably the man has uh, a greater chance than, than the women. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, but, uh, and, and at the same time, um, there's, there's also a need to ensure that the women that you do place are placed in seats which are actually winnable by the party. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it, it, from, from our experience, uh, in, in, in the last general election three months ago, uh, women were often sent to the, uh, the, the the incumbent women who already had their their their, their seats kept kept the, kept the same electorate. But for the new women, they were sent to the seats which were really hard to, hard for them to win. And then they was and then the the, op, the, the, the their opponents also apparently felt the same way because they were there. We had a woman fighting a woman, mm. and, and, and and so they they, they negated each other. Anne. I think um, in terms of the question you asked, you know, is it the, um, the party, is it the candidates or the aspiring candidates or is it the voters? You know, I really think it's all three um, that, that, that should be working together. I mean, I don't know much about the Greens. I can't I speak for them. But I find uh, it astonishing that in that seat... Uh, that could actually be winnable under certain circumstances, and you might argue that the, you know, in the aftermath of the PNG you know, solution, um, that there's going to be a huge shift of votes away from Labor to the Greens uh, in certain electorates. That if there had been a young woman, particularly a woman of say non-Anglo background, running in that seat, she would have had the Greens would have had a really good chance of winning. Julie, have you an opinion? Look, I, I, I feel like someone needs to say the words Emily's List. And, and I, I'm not a, a member of the Labor Party, but I've emceed a few Emily List events. And uh, please correct me if I get it wrong, but essentially it's a, 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 a lobbying group of progressive Labor women uh, who have been successful in getting more women into... Uh, seats including winnable seats so and I'd like to pay tribute to Joan Kerner who we've sadly recently heard is unwell uh, f because she was obviously a great uh, leader in relation to that can I tell you I'm by nature an individualist I am I mean I'm lust for merit-based appointments and I I think it's particularly hard for the Liberal Party which has a strong focus on the individual and, and merit but my personal view is I do, I do support affirmative action within the political context because I think it is still culturally so hard for women, one, to expose themselves to the abuse that you get. Uh, you say a tough hide. You know, how do you get a tough hide if it's not your natural instinct? Uh, I think that's a very hard question. So I think it's culturally hard for women also to engage in the oral combat that I was describing earlier. Uh, and uh, we in Australia, I consider ourselves the luckiest women in the world. Please tell me if, it, if it's not right. But, you know, we have, you know, medically supervised abortion. We have access to education. Uh, we have uh, access to work. We have socialised medicine to a very significant degree and inadequate, but we do have childcare. You know, we are very lucky people and we're still not cracking 30%. Um, and, 
you know, it's clearly culturally hard and I do think the issue of, ch of children is a huge part of that. So I think we do need affirmative action um, even though... And I think then women, or women of merit can compete for those limited places. May I, thank, please. May I, may I add to that on, on the affirmative action? Uh, I'm certainly in support of a quota system of uh, number of candidates that you field in an election and number of seats that are reserved for... Uh, uh, MP, female MPs in Parliament, and uh, there's empirical evidence for that. In the world, there are some 30 countries which have achieved 30% uh, uh, representation of uh, female MPs in the lower house, and of these 30-something uh, countries, 23 of them have a quota system, and that's how they achieved it. And I would also add uh, just a, a little uh, caveat to that is that, uh, that, of course, the affirmative action uh, is not forever. There must be conditions set to it that uh, says that uh, this, uh, this is a special circumstance, and until and when the circumstances have uh, improved to an extent in which that can be sustainable itself, uh, then that quota should be removed. Thank you very much. We've come. We got one more question. Okay, do I have one? Okay. Up if you could please stand up so the panelists can see you. Thank you. Hi. Um, I've worked in clinical health for the last 20 years and the um, majority of my patients in a few different modalities have, have been women. And my experience of women is that they're, they're well educated, they're trying to do all the right things that they believe is the right, um, doing health, um, seeking medical support, eating right, exercising, looking after their family. They're, they're giving, giving, giving. Um, and they get to the point of, of exhaustion because um, uh, and, and, they're doing all the time. Uh, recently I've stepped back from clinical health and I've joined organisations which are um, predominantly male. Um, uh, filled, uh, I'm working with a lot more men and um, there's all these penis and cock jokes that go around all day, every day, which it's their humour and it seems to be self-ratifying, which I'm... I don't quite understand, but I'm quite amused by. Um, so my question is that do we, do we need to, you know, uh, laughter's the best medicine, so do we as women need to find a, a common theme of, uh, of symbolism, is it our breasts or something else, <laughs> that we can pull together that, 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 that combats, not even combats, but complements that and, and pushes it back or, or helps us raise ourselves to a new level. Does, that, does it mean to kind of light, lighten our load through, through a bit of comedy about our... Absolutely. Yeah. We, we take ourselves so seriously. So seriously. Yeah. Who wants to feel that one? I'm always up for a bit of a laugh at myself. I'm the, you know, an alleged comedian on the panel, but... <laughs> I, 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 are you going to go into politics, Julie? I, I, know, I think <laughs> politics is a serious business. I, I actually think at the moment we have very significant national challenges. Mm. To get disability care with sustainable funding so that women, fathers and mothers, but there's an awful lot of mothers, don't sacrifice their entire lives <laughs> to the care of disabled children, we need really, really good public administration and significant tax increases, guys. I'm, I'm afraid uh, at the moment, if I could just... I know we're nearly at Go the right end. Ahead. But right now, I think we, ha we have both sides of politics apparently making huge policy commitments, not even consulting the public servants, not getting proper briefings and analysis, and committing extraordinary amounts of funds. Disability care has had a number set for a levy on us, but it hasn't been properly costed. So for things like disability care, for things like the health system in clinical care to cope with the ageing population, to make sure kids have enough jobs as we uh, deal with this I amazing change in Southeast Asia in relation to the economy, we need good ministers, not eight leaving at a time when there's an ugly moment and a spooky guy comes back. You know, we need good... <laughs> Sorry for that political comment, but we need... Uh, I just like a little bit of mental stability in my leaders. Call me old-fashioned. Um, but I want good, experienced ministers. Oh, wow. And I want, I want heads of department who've got a little bit of tenure and security so they can give uncomfortable advice because we've got national challenges that need good public administration. And it ain't happening at the moment. I'm sorry, it ain't happening. And on that note, I've got to close it out. Please thank... Your panelists, Dr. Ann Summers, Julie McCrossan, Materia Ture, and Adrian Leong. Thank you very much. And it's great to have a couple of local women, uh, academics, uh, people who are part of the cultural fabric.
very exciting. It's really good. I love it. I love being here. You don't have to be involved in politics directly, but to understand the policy and to want to be an activist um, is important because we need people from the outside and people from the inside to change things. I just love how all corners of the female community come together and we um, they're comfortable. They're comfortable sitting and listening to each other and, and having, a, having a say. I wish it went on for longer actually and that, that there were more panels. Look, I think I'd like women to take away that even though politics is hard, even though you have to develop a thick skin because you will get brutal criticism, even though it involves oral combat when you're on the floor of a, a parliament and uh, engaging in debate, I, I want women to say, no, I will get involved in public life, that the passion for the issues will mean you'll cope with some of the brutality of political life. That's what I hope will happen.